So today I will be talking a little bit about um, the work that I've done on the NAS NASA Rock on Workshop. I have also worked on this with Kevin Pfeiffer and Ryan LeBron. So what is Rock On? So essentially what it is, is a collaborative effort of about 50 students and professors to build a bunch of sounding rocket payloads, which are basically a type of small science instrument that gets launched into space. It gets launched at the NASA Wallops Flight Facility on a two-stage Terrier Orion rocket, which I have a picture of here on the right. And it goes about 73 miles up into the air. And something interesting about a sounding rocket is that based off my understanding, it doesn't really stay in space for that long. Um, I think this one will be up for maybe about half an hour, uh, just for reference. So some rockets are up there for a while, some not so much. Um, this one is actually up there for about half an hour. So how it works is everybody works in teams to build these uh, discs you see on the left here, and I'll talk a little bit more about how they work later on. And they get stacked um, on the back of my t-shirt here. I just put a picture here so it's easy to see, but I think this does a pretty good job of showing how this works. Um, but these basically get stacked inside of the rocket, and then this is what gets launched. Um, they put all the names of the schools they forgot to grant in, so I added it in for the sake of the presentation. But I thought this was a good visual to see how it works. So the main um, components on the payload are the shield, which is here in the yellow circle, the Geiger counter, which is here in the blue square, and then they also have a G-switch. Basically, the G-switch is kind of, you could think of it as the power button. So when the, the um, disks are loaded into the rocket, they're, they're not powered. They're connected to the battery, but they're not, the battery isn't actually giving it any power. Once the, the rocket goes up and experiences a certain number of Gs, the gravity will pull down the G-switch. There's a little button. Um, this isn't the best picture. I, I apologize. I, I only had the pictures I took before I mailed it off, so I couldn't really take uh, a better one. But the, um, there's a little button under the switch that gets activated when this goes down due to the Gs. It like, pulls it down like a lever. And this activates the board, and then it will start um, the shield will start working and the Geiger counter will start working. And I'll talk a little bit more about how they work later on. But the main components of the shield are the accelerometer, the gyroscope, the pressure sensor, the temperature sensor, the humidity sensor, and the SD card. And then the Geiger counter is essentially a radiation detector. So more about the shield. Um, I have a nice big picture here for you. And what uh, what this does, so it's constant, constantly, once it's on, monitoring data, and it gets saved over here at F to the SD card. This picture doesn't actually have the SD card in it, but there's a little mini chip that goes right in here. And, um, and so there's a, a bunch of different components that are actively collecting data. So A over here, this is the accelerometer, and just like on your car, it tells you how fast it's going. And uh, this one is a little bit different than the one in your car, though, because it can tell you the speeds in any spatial direction. So there's one in the X direction, the Y direction, the Z direction, and then there's actually another one in the Z direction, which is because when you are um, launching the rocket, it's going straight up. So that's kind of the data that we're hoping to look for more specifically than the X or the Y direction. Uh, this here is the gyroscope, which tells you the, uh, I guess, circular motion or motion in any of the spatial directions. Um, C is the pressure sensor over here, so that tells you the pressure experienced by the board. D is the temperature sensor. Um, I'm not entirely sure. I think it's this is the one that's the temperature sensor um, right here, this capacitor, but um, it, it works all, the temperature and the pressure sensor are both on this board here. And then um, e over here is the humidity sensor, and this just tells you the humidity that the board experiences. Something interesting that I that well we noticed while working on this is that it takes a while to once it recognizes the humidity, it takes a while to um, go back down to normal. Because I 
I think what's happening is there's this little metal piece here and it seems that when it experiences is humidity, it kind of sticks to it a little bit, the water particles, which means it recognizes humidity a little longer than it might be in the air, um, which is, I thought was kind of interesting, but yeah, so that's how the shield works. And underneath the shield, there's an Arduino board. So we wrote a lot of code to make it possible to see the data and analyze the data. Um, I don't have any formal data, but this is the data that I have from doing the tests to make sure that everything worked okay. So um, I apologize for the titles and the axes not being entirely labeled, but um, this was just kind of a, a brief run through to make sure everything was working, but I can explain it um, a little more. But this over here is the uh, one of the accelerometer data. It's the X, Y, and Z data. Uh, we can just basically see that it's working. Um, what I did was I moved the board in all these directions just to make sure that these peaks correlated with when I was moving it. This is the pressure data. The way that we got this was we took a solder sucker and put it on top of the pressure sensor and clicked the button. And you could see when we clicked the button, there's a, a, a spike here correlating with that, which means that's working okay. This is the temperature data. What I did was rub my hands together and just touch the, the sensor and made sure that it rose accordingly, which it did. This is the other Z accelerometer I was talking about. And you could see that when I, as I was moving the board, um, the line correlates with my movement. Um, and then the humidity sensor at the end, I just breathed on the sensor to see that it peaked. And then the gyro data, um, again, as I was doing these tests, the board was moving just to make sure that it was moving okay. We did some rotations in various directions, but this is the data that I have so far. Hopefully once it gets launched, um, we'll have some better data that will correlate to what's going on in, in I guess, 73 miles up into the sky, which I think will be very interesting to see. Um, but this is the data that I have so far. Okay, so this is the Geiger counter. I thought this part was really, really cool. This is basically a radiation detector. So over here at point A, we have the power, which is just connected to the battery basically. And then this over here at point D, this is a tube full of an inert gas. They didn't really specify exactly what the gas is, um, but I do know that when there's any radiation near the gas, it can detect it. And the way that the circuit is set up, uh, when it detects radiation, it makes a clicking sound through the speaker here at part C, and the LED lights up over here at point B. So um, I'll, I have a video. So just um, notice that in the video at the beginning, it only detects the background radiation. So there'll be a light and a click um, very unfrequently. And then I hold up, uh, it's, they called it Fiesta wear which is just basically a ceramic plate that was smashed. So a little piece of a ceramic plate with uh, radioactive paint on it. And you can notice that when I hold up the uh, radioactive paint to the little gas tube, you can see the light blink a lot more. And then, um, and then on the screen, you're gonna see it outputs the counts for every five second interval. Um, so you can see how high it gets when the, the radioactive material is near the gas. Oh, I don't know that I'm sharing my sound. Let me just do that first. Sorry about this. Okay, now you should be. So you could see that before I held it to the, the gas, you could see it was about one or nine. And then once I held the, the radioactive paint coated ceramic thing to it, um, the number went up. So I could play it again, just so you can see. I thought that was very interesting. 
And then this is the data that I had from that. Um, I didn't actually activate it till later on, which is why there's no data here. Um, but when I did, I put the Fiesta way right to it and you can see the numbers peaked. When I took it away, they kind of dropped back down, which indicates that it's working. And then, so after that, I assembled it all onto that disk I showed you at the beginning. And then I had to go through a series of checks. Um, so this is the ultimate check. Um, I won't go through everything that we checked with you guys, but we had to fill out these sheets just to make sure that it was in compliance with the required values. Um, if it's not, it's not able to fly. So um, once I did this, then I sent these over to uh, Chris Kohler, who is the man at the Colorado Space Grant Consortium who's organizing this whole thing. And we had a meeting with him just to make sure that everything uh, checks out and that the board is assembled correctly and all that. Um, and then after that, I shipped it off to back to Colorado where they are going to just once again inspect it to make sure that it works okay. Um, so as I mentioned, they do get launched, but there's only 28 spots that get launched on a rocket. The rest of them are going to go up on a hasp of weather balloon. Um, this is actually interesting because this is the first year they're doing the hasp weather balloon, so they don't have any data from them from these disks that we built. So that will be interesting to see um, the projects that go up on that. Today, actually, at 12 uh, Mountain Time, or I think that's about 2 p.m. Eastern Time where we are, um, they're going to host a raffle to see which flight decks or those circles will be launched. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to see that later today. And then on the 10th, they have a Zoom meeting. It's live to show the deck integration, which is basically them stacking up those circles. And then the flight uh, the, of the rocket occurs on June 24th, and then all the other ones go up in the Hass balloon September 28th. And then after that, my understanding is they're going to send us back the disks and we'll get to look at the data that they collected. So I'm very excited to see that. So my acknowledgements, um, I wanna say thank you to the NASA Pennsylvania Space Grant Consortium for their support and funding this opportunity, as well as the Colorado Space Grant Consortium for making this possible. And thank you to NASA WALPS Flight Facility for uh, agreeing to launch this for us. And most importantly, thank you to Dr. Purcell for informing us about this project and his support along the way. And then this is a picture. These are actually on the website of me and Kevin uh, with our completed, um, our completed disks here. Uh, we did have a third team member, Ryan. Unfortunately, early on, he had to commit to a lot of schoolwork. So um, he didn't get to uh, finish it up with us, but we do also appreciate his help with soldering some of the materials on here. So if anyone has any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Okay, so I have, I have a couple of comments. Um, the Fiesta Ware was really popular ceramic plates and cups and saucers and bowls made by a company in the 1930s. They had many different colors. You could buy them in turquoise or yellow or green or orange. And it turned out that the glaze they used for the orange color was high in uranium. And so it's 14% uranium and that makes it radioactive. Nobody knew that at the time. Um, and then uh, when you got into the 1940s and our country began to build um, atomic bomb, they said, where can we get another source of uranium? It's very hard to dig out of the ground. And somebody said, well, if you go to the Fiesta Ware Company, they have a whole pile in their yard of uranium ore, which they're going to use for orange glaze. So they went and took it all. So they, <laughs> they don't make that color of orange anymore, um, but they have a different lighter color of orange you could buy that's perfectly safe. And they still sell them at you know Macy's and, and various uh, companies that do that. So some of us in physics go around to garage sales and buy up the old orange ones and have a stockpile of bowls and plates and whatnot. You have a very small one. I have a, I have a whole bowl and you hold it up to one of these things and go, 
<laughs> That's so cool. I didn't realize all that. <laughs> it's really, really exciting. And it was never any danger to anybody um, because the danger from this type of radioactivity, so it's very short range, it can't get through your skin, is if you ingest it. And nobody eats the plate they're, they're using and it's glazed, so it's fixed to the plate. It doesn't ever slough off at all. So they're really very safe, but it's um, exciting things for physics labs. Also, I wanted to know if you knew about the um, group in California, the Earth to Sky Calculus. I don't know. Okay. Um, they're sponsored by uh, spaceweather.com. Uh, and so I exhort you to go to spaceweather.com and look down about three quarters of the page. And they have this group of high school students and their tutors who have um, flown a whole bunch of these radiation detectors, small Geiger counters on commercial aircraft. So they have data on different routes of commercial aircraft closer or not so close to the North Pole and different altitudes at which the airplanes fly. And the higher you get in the atmosphere, the less buffering there is or absorption. And so um, they have, and they also have a list then of which flights in the last week were exposed to the most radiation from space and below which altitude you don't have to worry at all. And so <laughs> I think it's kind of interesting and I believe it's the same sort of detectors you have, but you might look into that and see if you could um, find out more about what exactly they're using. That's so. very interesting. I'll, I'll definitely look into that. Thank you. Spaceweather.com. Okay. Thank you so much, Veronica. That was wonderful. Are there any other questions from students either in the room or um, online? Yeah, um, here, and if you're in the room, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring the computer over to the person so they can ask the question. You guys had a lot of fun doing this. Yeah, it was so hey, much fun. <laughs> um, I just had a question about how much did the um, thing weigh, the whole disc? That's actually a good question. I would say it was a couple pounds. I think when they weighed my box to mail it, it was about nine pounds total. Okay. So minus the weight of the box, probably about eight pounds, I'd say. So you guys will get the data transmitted or like, do you just get the hardware back? So that we're going to get the hardware back. So they launch it up and the little SD card um, that I showed you, that's collecting the data. And then my understanding is they're going to send it back to us and then we can put the card into our computer uh, with a USB adapter to see the data that it collected. Cool. Cool stuff. You get to launch stuff in space. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, I'm so excited. 